Thank you very much. You may be seated. Days after President Muhammad Buhari signed the 2022 budget into law, the Minister of Finance is leading other government officials to discuss the workings of the budget. She starts by giving the major highlights of the 2021 budget performance, which she pegs at 94%. As at November 2021, federal government's aggregate revenue was $5.51 trillion. This represents 74% of the prorated target. The federal government share of oil revenues was $970.3 billion, representing 53% performance prorated target for the oil and gas revenues. For the year 2022, there are ambitious plans following the presidential assent to the finance bill. This will introduce new tax reforms to fund the nation's budget deficit of 6.3 trillion naira. Plans on how to finance the 2022 budget deficit servicing model are also being worked out. There is a law now that has imposed duty on non-alcoholic carbonated sweetened beverages. So there is now an excise duty of 10 naira per liter imposed on all non-alcoholic carbonated and sweetened beverages. And this is designed to, one, discourage excessive consumption of sugar in beverages, which contributes to a number of health conditions, including diabetes and obesity. But also, this new sugar tax in, is introduced to raise excise duties and revenues for health-related issues and other critical expenditures. The sectoral breakdown of the 2022 budget shows defense and security still tops with 2.29 trillion naira, which is about 2 billion naira lower than the proposed 2.4 trillion naira by President Muhammad Buhari. Infrastructure is now 1.42 trillion naira, as against the 1.45 trillion naira proposed by the president. Health is now 876.3 billion naira, which is higher than the 820 billion naira presented by the president, while education is now 1.23 trillion naira, as against the 1.29 trillion naira proposed by the president. The budget deficit stands at 6.3 trillion naira, while debt servicing is over 3.6 trillion naira. The Minister of Finance addresses concerns over the increasing cost of debt servicing in Nigeria. At 3.61 trillion, debt service is 21% of the total expenditure of the 2022 budget, and it is 34% of the projected revenue of the 2022 budget. In all, the federal government hopes that this budget reflects the economy, which has been affected by COVID-19 pandemic, insecurity and dwindling investments. And that's precisely where we're going to be looking right now. Dr. Mikael Kingwu, who is a development economist, chief executive officer and Hill Concepts Limited, and also former member National Technical Working Group Committee of the Vision 2020 project, uh, joins us in our studios. You're welcome. And a happy new year happy to you, Happy new year, sir. my boy. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I do, I do not know whether from what you see, the projections of what we intend to spend in 2020, 2022, <laughs> 2021, uh, coming from how we did and how we fared with the budget in 2021, will truly give Nigerians a happy new year. Do you see that from the breakdown as put up by the Minister of Finance? Well, I think that the first thing to do is to recognize that the president for the first time in a long time have raised issues. He signed the budget, uh, but he, he has also said, I am not going to operationalize this budget until we resolve some very thorny issues. And these issues are heavy, you know, because as this 400 billion add up, there's the issue of the sinking fund. And then there are the reductions from very critical uh, MDAs like uh, energy, transportation, uh, agriculture. I mean, I think energy, uh, they're yanked off about 14 billion, transportation about 15 billion, uh, agriculture about 12 billion. And he says, you haven't explained this to me and this, these are very critical. And then he talked about even the reductions from the Navy and police funds. Now, these things are key. So, uh, except we're going to be operating or having this conversation on the assumptions that this has been resolved. I, I don't think it has, and, so, and they are key. But if we're going to say, okay, let's keep that aside and then, you know, work with what it is we have. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather not look at the figures. Uh, I'll, look at, I'll look at 
the, the sections. Okay, we're, we're talking about the formal economy and we're talking about the informal economy. For the formal economy, yes, it's, it's, it's going to run. Okay, it looks promising. But unfortunately, over 80% of the population is in the informal economy. And this is where you need to begin to now look at how you can begin to build inclusiveness. And I think that is where the challenge of this budget will be for me. Because those agencies, those MDAs that are supposed to be creating this inclusiveness, being able to create this synergy between the formal and informal sector, are now the, the sectors that are gaps in. And last time I listened to the Minister of Transportation and our NTA, he was talking about you know, needing to raise $36 billion to be able to conclude you know, the transport infrastructure needed or the stock needed in the country. And then this is a ministry you're removing about 14 billion you know, from their budgetary allocation. And the, and the man kept saying, it's not even about me borrowing. I can't even find this money to borrow. So I am going to be working with what it is that I'm going to be getting from the national budget. So th these, are, these are where, for me, uh, and the, the president keeps emphasizing on agriculture and emphasizing on going back to the land. And I'm saying, yes, the interpretation of going back to the land might not necessarily you know, mean take hoe and digger. It, it, it means go back into productivity. That's how I read it. And if I read it correctly, then I think what the president is, is actually saying is, let us get more innovative in trying to be able to solve you know, our agricultural and food production, food security needs. And this is where technology also comes to play. And I glanced through uh, the allocations to the Ministry of Science and Technology, a capital of about, I think, 143 billion. But now when you look at these critical sectors, these critical areas that allow them to begin to now deploy research outputs, that allow them to now begin to, you know, get into the local governments or communities to begin to, you know, actually get innovative. You find budget lines like 20 million, 7 million, and then you begin to wonder, you know, if we are really in sync with what I might be able to call our socio-economic realities. Well, there are so many questions. And when you look at where we are vis-a-vis uh, -vis our infrastructure and the needs that we have, almost every area looks critical. Yeah. Is it health? Is it education? Is it infrastructure? Is it security? You know, so many areas and every single one of them needs funds to be able to move, so as it were. And sometimes it would seem that some other, uh, let's say, less critical uh, apparent they look they appear less critical tend to take the hits for instance uh, science and technology uh, etc but let me quickly flip this to Lagos now because I understand that my colleague Ayo has another guest in the studio thank you Mark where we have Kenneth Erikume who is a tax partner tax reporting and strategy at PwC he joins us here thank you so much for joining us today good morning thanks for having me um, well so let me just speak to your part of the, of the whole idea, which is tax. Uh, on the front pages this morning, we have a situation where, of course, the minister also said it, that there is a 10 naira per liter tax on soft drinks. It will seem like every opportunity to tax everyone is, is just where it is. That is beyond the provisions of the Finance Act, which also, you know, amends a good number of, of laws. Um, um, first of all, your assessment of all of these and how they are likely to impact everyone. Let, let's begin if, with a general overview. Right, so thank you very much. I, I think the first thing to realize about um, our budgeting is that um, while it looks like 17 trillion is a lot of money, um, comparing it with other countries, it's not a lot. It's actually peanuts. Um, if you do an assessment of that, uh, you know, with our population size um, and do a division, that would be about 85,000 Naira being budgeted for every citizen of Nigeria for the full year. Um, if you contrast that with um, a country like South Africa, where the budget um, of the central government is about 2 trillion rand. Um, in Naira terms, that's about 60 trillion Naira. Um, compare that with 17 trillion. And their population size is about 60 million, um, which means that 
you know, for each citizen of South Africa, the budget is about 1 million naira. Compare that with 85,000 naira being budgeted for every Nigerian. So in the context of that, that looks like, um, you know, in, in relative terms, um, the budget is not so large. Um, and therefore, um, in terms of the impact, which we've seen year on year, um, the impact is not um, significant. Um, however, um, one of the things you would also notice is that um, even though the, rev the, the expenditure target, which is about 17 trillion, is a lot, on the revenue side, we're still not able to catch up um, because the revenue that is being projected is about 10 point something trillion naira for this year, which gives a deficit of about 6.4 trillion naira. Um, the implication of that is that um, you would have to borrow to fund that deficit. Um, and if your revenue does not improve, you'll be in that vicious cycle of borrowing um, consistently. And that, that I, I think, is, is something that's concerned a good number of people over time. And one of the issues some people have raised is, look, it is simple economics. Cut your clothes according to your cloth, not according to your size, because your size, you don't have enough cloth to make a clothes for yourself. So for those who are saying, let's cut down on governance, or on, on, on government spending, or governance spending, the recurrent expenditure and all, do you see a chance that that can even be uh, considered? Um, so not at the moment. From the presentation of the, minist the Minister of Finance, it was clear, um, and I think it's been consistent with this administration, um, that restructuring of payroll um, and downsizing is not going to be an option. That also has its own economic impact. If you're going to be, uh, you know, people are losing their jobs, it means that the economy would um, be depressed eventually because people will not have enough income to, to spend. I think what we need to focus on as a country is not necessarily the, the size of the recurrent expenditure. Um, in my opinion, what we need to start looking at is the quality of the output um, from that recurrent expenditure. Do you see that matching? I don't see it matching because when you look at, you know, um, government services generally in terms of health care, in terms of education, in terms of, um, you know, uh, and you compare that with when private sector individuals are involved in those services, there is a huge gap between what government is able to deliver um, and what, you know, what should normally be delivered. So Which I think that quality in terms of government services and value is what, you know, what is fundamentally lacking because that's what stimulates the private sector. Which then raises the question that a number of people are asking about, look, if we are not getting value for money, we're not getting quality for this spending we're doing, and you want us to pay more tax, why should we trust the process? We'll come to that when we return from this break. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, we're still talking about uh, an assessment of the 2022 budget breakdown. Uh, Kenneth Erikume is still here, tax partner, tax reporting and strategy, PwC. I have two issues to raise with you before we go back to Abuja. Uh, so I wanted to ask, answer that question. Why should people pay more when they are not getting value for money? Okay. Um, so I was building um, and, you know, one of the things that you would notice is that our debt service to revenue ratio is quite high, um, which means that um, for every cash flow that the government generates, a lot of it goes into debt servicing. Um, for if you were looking at a company, the company then needs to generate more revenue to be able to fund or, or, or service that debt. Um, and I think that that's, that is fundamentally the focus. Um, however, um, you know, it has been said that, it, you know, Nigeria has um, some of the lowest taxes across Africa, but that is not exactly correct, right? Um, at the company's income tax level, 30% um, is quite high compared to other African countries where you'll be seeing about 25% tax rate. And in addition to 30%, we have education tax of 2%, and we have other taxes 
Nigeria is one of the countries where we have minimum tax, which means that if a company does not even make a profit, it's supposed to go and borrow money to pay minimum tax. Um, and then we've also introduced um, the significant economic presence rules, which means that you know, if services are being provided from outside Nigeria, there's a withholding tax of 10%. Um, and digital companies also have to file returns and declare their profits in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So by any standards, from a company's income tax perspective, we're not a low tax jurisdiction. For VAT, where we say you know, VAT rate is one of the lowest in Africa, 7.5%, um, it's actually the lowest in Africa in terms of rate. But in terms of implication, it's not. Right? In other African countries, when you incur cost and you suffer VAT at, seven, at whatever rate it is, it does not form an absolute cost you're able to recover it when you're charging your customers. Mm. But in Nigeria, that opportunity does not exist in the law. You know, it's almost like a sales tax because the only time you're able to recover your input VAT on your purchases is when you're a manufacturer, you buy goods to manufacture or you buy goods to sell. So for example, your, your, your TV station, every single cost that you incur automatically that VAT becomes an absolute cost. That's not the same way in other jurisdictions. Um, so it, it has a cascading effect, which means that that 7.5% ultimately is not that low. You're making it sound like the private sector is doomed. Um, <laughs> not, not exactly. Um, so I was happy to see that the Minister of Finance presentation, even though she spoke about the um, comparative tax rate, also mentioned you know, the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative and outlined some of the things that government is doing. Um, and when I looked at it, not, you know, many of them were not about raising taxes or introducing no, new taxes. Okay. You know, um, one of the things which mentions and resonates with me is to increase the capacity of government um, to, to administer the taxes and make it easier for taxpayers to um, compute and file their tax returns um, using technology. Um, for profiling and discovery of taxpayers, um, reviewing incentives, because that has formed you know, significant leakages in, in government over time where incentives are granted, but they're not monitored, they're not being monitored around what, are the Im what is the impact on the economy and okay. the value it's creating. Okay. So those are some of the strategic revenue growth initiatives that she mentioned. But the one which you mentioned, which I think um, a lot of people are scratching their heads about, is that 10 naira per litre tax, which is introduced for soft um, drinks. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I don't even know where to go about that. But, uh, I, and I know your position about the question I'm about to ask. So let me throw it to Dr. Emeka Okengu just before Malcolm takes over. So Dr. Okengu, there is this um, statement ascribed to the president of the AFDB, Akio Meadishino, um, who says, while tax rates are relatively low in Nigeria, it simply is not an excuse to keep increasing taxes. In Norway, Tax to GDP ratio is 39%. Singapore's tax to GDP ratio is 13.2%. Nigeria's tax to GDP is 6.1%. But in Norway, education is free through university. Singapore today has 100% access to electricity and water. And it went on and on. What would be your own take on especially the tax element uh, of, this, of this budget in the light of what uh, Professor additional has said well i think what's what's key for us to understand is that government needs taxes to be able to operate that's how they earn income uh, but in also introducing taxes you must also make certain that the social services that can be able to encourage you to end the taxes are available and this is where i think uh, we have the challenge of taxes and this is where it's beginning to look as if uh, people are being overtaxed uh, and that government is not showing compassion. Uh, remember that the economic sustainability plan is, is been all about throwing money at problems, you know, trying to see how you can be able to get, you know, companies back on their feet again. And uh, from what uh, the CBN is uh, hinting at, maybe by March of next year, uh, a lot of those loans uh, are going to be called back. Unfortunately, Nigeria is not a country where you have uh, patient capital, where you have you know, government being able to support you with, gov with capital that is not debt. 
So um, 80% of the times you throw this money against, uh, you need to now start building your own infrastructure. You need to now start pro providing your own critical, especially energy, security, even roads where it comes. So it makes the tax thing a little bit uh, more of an academic exercise, if you may, than something that you can be able to really feel. It, it becomes very difficult uh, for you not to want to uh, even if the tax was to, was to be 2%, you still see a lot of challenges against Spain. And this is because uh, government in expanding its tax net has not also been able to equip you know, uh, those sectors that can be able to now engage or open up uh, the windows for new opportunities, new jobs to be created. People are losing jobs. And again, in all this, I think what even worries me more is that we have not captured the fact that COVID-19 is getting worse. It's not getting any better. And it is something that it doesn't give you a plan. There's no program. Uh, look at government now saying to you, uh, maybe by, by sometime this month or so, if, a, if our policy kicks in, you're not able to enter into any government office or do government business if you're not showing your tax result or you have not been vaccinated. This is going to kill a lot of businesses too. And we're not understanding that, yes, we might have gotten out of recession, but we had a mixture of what you could call a recession and a depression. Okay, whereas you can say the formal economy, you know, recessed. I mean, the informal economy got into total and complete depression. So the tax thing is, is for me, is, is very, is very tony. It's, 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 mm. it's, 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 it's something we need to walk. It's a, it's a line, it's like putting us, you know, between the rock and the hard place. You know, wherever it is you go, uh, like they say in the military, is a catch-22 problem in Nigeria. Even for government, I mean, if that's for the citizens, even for the government might also feel that way as well, because, you know, citizens will continue to ask which one will come first, the, yes. like the chicken and the egg situation. Must infrastructure improve first before, uh, you know, citizens will be willing to pay more taxes? And if, if that will be the answer, how, by how much must infrastructure improve? Because government will say, at least, in some areas, they're beginning to see progress in terms of infrastructure being deployed huh. or being built in those areas. Huh. Uh, but, but I'm wondering, one of the first ones we have seen, one of the first um, immediate areas where government is looking to increase the sources of income is through excise. We've seen a 10 naira um, excise duty slammed on every uh, liter of uh, carbonated and uh, sweet drink, so to speak. And they say it's because they're also trying to reduce... Uh, the incidence of diabetes and ob obesity. Now, when you look at how that is supposed to go into health, which is another social, uh, supposed to be a social uh, infrastructure and investment, um, and how well our health system currently is, uh, some people also find it difficult to tell, but how do you think it will immediately impact those who are dealing in the business of food and beverages? The first question will be, at what point do you collect the tax? This will be the challenge. And what infrastructure do you have to be able to calculate? You know, do you pay at the point of sale or do you pay at the point of production? Wherever the tax is paid, yeah, well, the high, wouldn't it be ultimately transferred that, to that, the consumer? That, that's what I'm saying. That the, 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 final, the final victim, if you may, is going to be the consumer. If you're going to say pay at the point of production, okay? and you're going to say pay at the point of consumption. The point of production might be a little easier for you to be able to pick it up because all you need to do is to be able to check, you know, the volume, okay? But again, remember that most of these privileges are also imported and they also come with, you know, taxes that they pay. So what they're just simply going to do, and you, 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 don't, have, you don't have a regulated, you know, pricing system in Nigeria. So you're going to be having people bringing these things and then it's, 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 it's going to be messy. I think the, the proper thing government must look at in, 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 in trying to run this country is to recognize that one, a lot of indicators that they have put into trying to operationalize this budget uh, has been put in some kind of storm, if you may, you know, with the infractions or 
uh, the, 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 what the president had, had said he noticed was wrong, and, and that these are questions that need to be answered. And then when we keep talking about uh, the government uh, agencies that are supposed to be generating these revenues, if you look at it, I mean, the, the figures that are actually looking at is about one point something trillion, and you mentioned excise. Now, excise only comes when you have goods and services coming in. All right? In Europe now, uh, I know for certain uh, in a country like Spain, about 18 of your shipyards have been shut down. A lot of these businesses are closing down. Manufacturing businesses are closing down. What you actually see excelling now are businesses that are not operating in the virtual world. Yes, they have put in some kind of taxes for people who are even operating in that digital space. Mm -hmm. But are you going to be able to, uh, again, do you have that uh, blockchain infrastructure? Do you have that back infrastructure to be able to now, you know, also monitor and be able to get your payments? Mm -hmm. And then if you do, what percentage would that be as against the goods that are going to be coming into your seaports? But at least the first thing is to identify it. Uh, identify these areas where you can actually get tax. From. It's, been, it's been there, Mawe. It's always been there. I mean, it's not a new area. Exercise duties have never been a new area. I mean, the customs made, I think, over 500 billion. No, no, it's you when know. you talk about the uh, my city. Okay, the uh, ICT, yeah, ICT. Yes, the ICT area. Mm. I mean, some people will say that we had overlooked that. Is maybe the fact that other European countries are beginning to look at uh, the, the, the social media giants that we are now beginning to say, oh, wait a minute, we can also look there as well. So it's a good thing that we're identifying those areas as places where we can increase our sources of revenue. But in terms of ex excise for food and beverages, particularly uh, sweetened and carbonated mm -hmm. drinks, uh, the question will be, haven't they been doing that before? And why should they be such a, a big, big deal? deal? Uh, uh, in terms of being able to get the attack. And, and it's not there. as if they're saying the 10, the 10 naira they're going to be putting on is going to be put inside a fund that will now support health, you know, research that's and all that. That's what it seems they're saying. That's what it seems they're saying. That's what it seems, but that's not what it is. Because if it is, then that fund should be created. Like we created the PTF. I mean, everybody was clear. Government was very clear then when they were creating the PTF that they were going to be adding 2 naira or 3 naira, I can't remember clearly, onto the price of petroleum products per liter, and that that three naira was going to be channeled to that fund, and they created it. So who is going to warehouse this 10 naira? Who is going to be the one collecting? How are you going to be aggregating? So these are, these are, all, these are all the issues that must be talked through. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. the government does not even have that time anymore. You know, I think that what should be looking at now is these 13 months or 14 months left of you know, actual gov governance. To what extent are we able to consolidate, okay, on every other program? This is supposed to be a year of consolidation for me because this is technically, if you may, okay, the last full budget that this government is going to run. And with, with our history of extending this budget, you know, uh, timing to about March of next year, uh, it simply means that they might also extend this. So by the time you get to March, you would have only about three or four months you know, for the government to be winding up. Are you confident, are you, um, do you feel reassured with our current uh, deficit where we, we are and uh, our debts to revenue ratio? It's been a problem with something we've looked at, uh, but looking at how we've addressed it in this budget, uh, does it give you some confidence that we could really be able to pay back our debts no, comfortably? It, no, it doesn't because it's, it's actually going to get worse because we seem to be fixated on, on what's on. We're not being innovative in creating new things. All right? And, and that's why I say to you that when the president says, let's go back to the land, you know, I don't read it as who and the matchet. I read it as, listen, somehow we need to get more inclusive. All right? He also keeps talking about the cattle routes and, uh, and the cattle reserves. I also do not see it as headsmen, you know, carrying sticks and walking you know, cattle through people's farms and through brushes. I also think it has to also do with putting some kind of innovation and technology to be able to support it. Uh, these are areas, I mean, the cattle economy is about 30 trillion. And I, I can just give you, on a daily basis, uh, what we earn from the cattle trade is about 4 billion. And I'm talking about fourth sale value. I can do the maths for you. If we are doing 40,000, and this is even in south, the southern part of the country, and I'm, to, I'm looking at a first sale value of 100,000 naira for one head of cattle. If you are doing 40,000 a day, which is what statistics show that we are consuming in southern Nigeria, it is 4 billion 
on a daily basis. But there is no infrastructure. And this is where, when you talk about infrastructure, you don't manage infrastructure. You either have infrastructure or you don't have it. Okay? Infrastructure has to be complete. It's like we're in this studio now, and then we say, okay, fine, let us even sit in the studio, and then we're still, still connecting the microphones. Nobody's going to hear us. We can sit in here and talk all we want. If you don't have, you know, the cameras being able to beam and those satellites are there and you now have power to be able to make certain that it gets into your central uh, transmitter, nobody's going to hear us. So when we're talking about infrastructure, it's not something you say, oh, it's work in progress. All right? You either have an infrastructure development program and then against it, now begin to now plan how you can start increasing your revenues. And as long as you don't have it, you are going to be singing to the choir. So this is, I think, where at the heart of the matter. Let's quickly take this to Lagos now. Well, Marco, thank you, um, Mr. Rikeme. I'm sure you you are you are itching to uh, respond to some of the things that Pro, uh, Dr. Okengu has uh, spoken to. Yeah, I, I think I, I concur 100% with um, um, his analysis. Um, the reality is that um, something needs to be done to transform the direction of, of things. If you look at the 2021 budget, um, you would discover that in terms of performance of expenditure, um, the government was doing about 94%. But in terms of revenue, um, the government was doing about um, 74%. What that means is that the deficit which they estimated um, for 2021, that deficit and that gap increased because the revenue performance was 74%, but the expenditure performance was 94%. So it means that revenue is not performing as well as expenditure. Is that uh, a question mark, my apologies for butting in, is that a question mark on the revenue collecting agencies or it's a question mark on the fact that we seem to prefer to spend more than to collect? Yeah, so spending is easy. <laughs> so no, I of think course. That, that, I mean, if you, give me, if you give me money today, I can spend it before, before leaving here. It's actually creating the value, um, which is what, um, um, you know, the analysis which I was agreeing with. You know, if you can create the value, and particularly infrastructure, because that's where the private sector thrives. Government can do a job. Uh, and what government does is to be an enabler um, for the populace, the economy, the economic activity, and the private sector. So when, when government is creating the infrastructure and provides that infrastructure, then the private sector can thrive. Mm. Um, and when things are easier for businesses, then it's easier for businesses to pay tax. Okay. Uh, and the analysis from Abuja was quite clear. You know, if you're paying for your security, if you're paying for your transport, if you're paying for your um, electricity, if you're paying for every single thing, you know, it begs the question, you know, how is my tax performing for me? Mm. Um, and therefore, that um, moral, um, you know, that contract, that civil contract, where there's a moral obligation on citizens driving them to contribute to their taxes, it, it's not there. Um, and therefore, you would now see a tendency more towards evasion. Is that in any way um, uh, highlighting the key assumptions of this, of this budget and, you know, the, that, that the, some of the key assumptions that the, the budget has raised? Is that, is that in any way putting a question mark on whether or not the budget is going to perform? Um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, that's a complicated question to answer. Um, but if you see the track record um, and you, you look at 2021 as an example, um, it, is, it is very likely that from a revenue side, things need to be done differently. Uh, and it's not just about raising taxes. Right? It's not just about raising taxes. Um, they've, they've introduced this 10 naira per litre. Um, they've spoken about improving you know, the revenue capacity. One of the things you will see in other countries, which is a structural problem with Nigeria, is that there is usually a mechanism at the central level to identify and collect taxes at the individual or personal level. 
So while in Nigeria, the personal income taxes are administered at the state level, um, in, in, in other countries, it is administered centrally, or at least a portion of it. So if you look at the United States, for example, you'd have the federal taxes and the state taxes. So every individual is in the IRS database. But the states can then overlay a rate, depending on your um, what, what we call fiscal competitiveness. Mm. So for example, people are moving into um, Lagos. So from that perspective, Lagos can say, well, I can introduce a state tax in addition to the federal taxes. That mm. will be high. Ogun State will say, well, I want to attract more into Ogun State. Um, so I would reduce my tax rate less than um, what is in, in Lagos. So that's what you see with um, um, Nevada, where, you know, um, and, and the likes of Delaware, where, you know, the states, in order to attract investment, have then taken off um, taxes or reduced taxes or cut okay. taxes so that people can come in. Is, is, uh, that, is that helpful to us? Yeah, that, that, that is instructive for us, I think. Um, it's just that, you know, from a structural perspective, um, it's difficult to change things because the Constitution uh, already allows the states to collect, you know, the personal income taxes. So yeah. what government ne then needs to do, mm. uh, and this, this is an important point because businesses are owned by individuals. So in your tax database, you must be able to identify um, and um, formalize individuals as well as properties. Once you do not have a, a central database that has that information, you would f discover that there'll be a lot of gaps in terms of you know, taxing the informal sector and the semi-formal, which is the bigger problem, that where people are making a lot of money, but yeah. they're not contributing. Well, we, we haven't really even been able to talk to that, because one of the th issues that a number of people have raised is there is that opening for the micro, small, and medium enterprises that you talked about that we haven't really been able to get them into some form of structure. There are so many issues to raise on this, uh, this budget issue. But, um, we're completely out of time. I wanted to ask, okay, maybe you can't speak to this in 30 seconds. Yeah. How futuristic do you see 2022 budgets for Nigeria? <laughs> or is it just for only 2022 and it ends in December? Um, so, unfortunately, a budget runs for one year. Yep. And the interesting thing about this year is that it's the year before a transition. Um, so you, you would discover that what m w the outlook for this budget will be more at establishing, you know, something this year before the transition happens um, next year. I'm actually talking about, uh, um, I'm talking about uh, sustainability of yeah. some of the things that the budget will achieve beyond 2022. Yeah. Do you see that happening? Yeah. So I don't see that happening within one year. Oh, dear. Um, because you, you obviously, this is a process. Okay. And, and to transform is not easy. To, to get a six-pack, you, <laughs> you have to devote time. Don't even go there. <laughs> Kenneth Rukume, tax partner, tax reporting and strategy, PwC. Thank you so much for your time this morning. And we've also spoken uh, with Dr. Emeka Okengu, who is a development economist, a chief executive officer, until. Uh, Concepts Limited. He is also former member National Technical Working Group Committee of Vision 2020 20 Project. Thank you so much, Doc, for your time this morning. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. So